Oh, hey, Professor Jit. Hi, Joey. Yeah, um, finally I got in. Okay, thank you. Oh, we're sorry. Nice. Okay, yeah. so it's great. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I was uh, wondering whether I can get in because I could not. No, get sorry in. about that. I don't know why that link wasn't working. Uh, yeah, people are getting in slowly, so that's yeah. good. Yeah. Good. So we probably can. I probably can try to see whether I can share my slides. Yeah, that is a good thing to test out. Okay. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, that's great. So then everything is fine. I don't have very fancy, you know, like uh, those simulations. So it's just a, okay. a typical one. So it should work. Yeah, then, then we are all set. Um, I'll give it a minute or so, and then we will start. Sure, that's good. Yeah, I was originally wondering whether it's Monday or Wednesday. I, oh, I, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's good, because once you send me a reminder, so I know yeah. it's today, yeah. Yeah, next time I'll send a reminder two, three days ago. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I think it's uh, uh, as long as two hours ago, it should be good enough. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess we will uh, get started. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming uh, to this uh, talk. It's uh, uh, the second of our distinguished uh, lecture talks. Uh, and I am delighted uh, to have uh, Professor Jawe Han uh, here to talk about his work on exploring the power of taxonomy and embedding in uh, text mining. Uh, Dr. Jawe Han is the Michael Eichen Chair Professor in the Department of Computer Science, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He received the ACN SIG KDD Innovation Award in 2004 IEEE Computer Society Technical Achievement Award in 2005, IEEE Computer Society W. Wallace McDowell Award 2009, and Japan's Punai Achievement Award 2018. He's a fellow of the ACM and a fellow of the IEEE, and he has served as the Director of Information Network Academic Research Center, INARC, from 2009 to 2016, supported by the Network Science Collaborative Technology Alliance, NSCTA program of the US Army Research Lab and co-director of NOENG, a center of excellence in big data computing, 2014 to 2019, founded by the NIH Big Data to Knowledge BD2K initiative. So that's the uh, formal bio, but informally Dr. Han has, um, written the book on data mining that I have used in my course. I have known his work and his students' work uh, for over 15 years now. Uh, he's one of the most well-cited computer scientists. Uh, and without further ado, I will 
and hand it over to Dr. Han. Thank you for uh, coming to this talk and we look forward to your talk on exploring the power of taxonomy and embedding in text mining. Dr. Han. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, thanks uh, for Professor Micha's uh, very nice introduction. So it's my great pleasure to give a talk at uh, Penn State. I actually visited Penn State uh, many years ago, give some talks and uh, get a, a lot of, you know, uh, exchange. I got uh, pretty excited with the, the, the research at Penn State. So now uh, I, with COVID, of course, everybody got a little inconvenience. But on the other hand, there are some convenience to give a talk because you really don't have to think about the booking flights, hotels, or anything. So we can talk, uh, you know, communicate freely uh, just using our computers and network. Okay. So my talk today is on exploring the power of taxonomy and the embedding in text mining. Okay. So I basically give you uh, some kind of short introduction, a few of our recent uh, studies on text mining. We feel pretty excited. And uh, I just want to uh, have some exchange with you to see whether you are interested in you know, those new methods on text mining. So I've been working on data mining uh, for many years. However, if you really study the majority part of the data, actually over 80% of our data is in some kind of a text forms, like either natural language or social media, uh, the major characteristics, they are unstructured. Uh, they are dynamic, they are very high dimensional. So the problem is with such a high dimensional data, how can we do effective data mining? Okay. So uh, in our recent work, we yeah, basically we got a, um, sort of three important well. lessons we learned. The first and lesson we, we learned uh, is uh, we need to do embedding. Okay. Embedding means we have to think about right? from a very high dimensional yeah. text so words and put them Somehow Good using morning. some method, some could be a neural method, kind of we can put them into a low dimensional space. So, me. The um, second important is thing is structuring. That means how can we turn unstructured um, text data into some, into some kind of structures, um, including taxonomy. Okay. Then we Turning can do out. taxonomy guided data mining. Okay. So I'm going to show you how these uh, three important directions we can you know, we work together uh, can make the data mining, text mining uh, quite effective. Okay. So our general philosophy, okay. uh, as far as you know, okay, so of course, this is very high dimensional. It, it is hard to, to, you know, to put them together. So what we do is why not use lots of annotation, but we use general knowledge base, dictionaries, Wikipedia, okay? Plus the text, working together, we can get uh, phrases, type the entities, relations. With this basic components, we can construct taxonomies or guided by taxonomies. We can construct a multi-dimensional space like multi-dimensional text cubes. And with this uh, taxonomies and the structures, we should be able to derive knowledge effectively. So that's the general framework, okay? So I'm going to show you a few of our recent work we think is pretty exciting, okay? You probably heard, uh, actually in 2013, Google uh, research published a very interesting article called Word Vec. Okay. And after that, Stanford get a globe, like uh, you know, Facebook, uh, FastX, and there are many, many newer things. Okay. The general philosophy is we want to map the very high dimensional different kind of uh, natural language words into a relatively lower dimension space. The property is the the words have the similar 
you know, semantic meaning, they sort of map in the closer space. So we can find, for example, if you find something related to kitchen, sink, bathroom, the related houses, they can be somewhere closer. Okay. And with such mapping, people even can do some kind of a computation. For example, from man to woman, if you draw the mapping space, just draw a vector, okay, then you may find it almost in a parallelogram, you can find a king and a queen in some kind of a nice, you know, parallel um, uh, you know, structures. Okay. However, okay, if we think about the mapping, we actually think about it, the majority of the use of similarity mapping is in the in using full sign similarity, actually is in the spherical space. For example, if you think of France and Italy rather close semantically, you will think these two vectors in the mapping should have a pretty small angle theta closer to zero. Okay. However, if you think of a bar and a crop diet, they are rather different. So their mapping somehow may form uh, theta is almost 90 degrees. But if you use mathematical computation like uh, France minus Paris, but the other one you don't say Italy minus Rome, you say Rome minus Italy. Actually this vector you know, computation, you almost get negative one. That means their similarity, the theta angle is almost close to 180 degrees. That means when we compute the word similarity, we're using cosine similarity mapping in the spherical space. However, we, when we compute, you know, like when we compute like a word of act or globe or something, we actually all map them into Euclidean space or matrix computation. There's some kind of mismatch. Okay. Another thing we can see the, the recent studies you look at the words, you always just look at the plus minus k, a small k, like plus minus pi, okay? You want to, you, for example, you, you, you based on this text, you say harmful, you want to figure out the meaning of harmful. What you do is you, you, you look at the surrounding words plus minus pi. However, if you look at this plus minus five or the surrounding words, it's almost nothing to explain what is harmful. However, if you look at it further, you actually will find alarm, pounding, shock, danger, rock, those things actually somehow closer to harmful. That means if we just look at plus minus K only, it's just too narrow window. We probably want to look at a bigger window, for example, a short documents, a paragraph, okay? So to that extent, we are looking at, you know, the word in D, D is a document or a paragraph, okay? So we need both. That means if we want to think about anything we want to see, when we do the ma mapping, we need a spherical space, we need both a local and a global mapping, okay? So with this idea, I would ignore the details, we in 2019 in New York's, in New York's conference, we published a paper called Spherical, John Spherical Embedding. The John Spherical Embedding we abbreviate is JOSE, okay? The JOSE basically you probably can see, if you study word similarity, you get a word of back, low wave, fast text, or even recent verb, or use Poincare Embedding for hyperbolic space. But you, you may find the word similarity wise, actually the spherical embedding capture the better semantics, okay? And not only that, you look at the computation power. Actually this, Joe say the computing with spherical embedding actually is pretty efficient, okay? It's a almost similar cost as word of act. However, you give the power, I can show you the power, like for example, you want to, uh, decompose, uh, deep, you know, uh, phrase these acronyms. For example, what's the meaning of CMU or UIC or PSU? So you just look at very local text 
That means if you set up our lambda into zero means you only look at the local war, you won't find a good hint on what should be CMU. However, if you look at a global context, you, the Carnegie Mellon Pittsburgh actually come up. Okay. Even you look at the antonyms, okay. For example, you look at a good versus bad. If you just look at a local context, actually good versus bad could be mapped into rather similar both or space. However, you look at the global context, you find a good versus bad, it could be pretty far apart. Okay. So that's the advantage. That's one thing you have to re-examine hex embedding in the spherical space. Another one we look at the embedding is the most of the embedding, including the GOC we proposed in 2019, actually is, uh, everything is completely unsupervised. That means user have no input. You just say, I want to find similarity between say Italy and France. However, I can give you an example. In many cases in your analysis, you may want to have some kind of user guidance to give a little preference. Then you can map them into a different space. For example, here I give you six people, okay? Six names, uh, including say Theresa May uh, versus uh, Donald Trump, okay? However, if you say, I'm more interested in distinguishing politics versus science versus literature, you probably can see you may like Richard Feynman and Isaac Newton to be mapped closer. Okay. However, if you say, I want to distinguish England versus United States, you probably will say Isaac Newton and Richard Feynman could be pretty far apart because the one was from England, the other one was from United States. Can we do such things? That means user gives some kind of category name. Okay. With this kind of name, we can guide our embedding to be preference to separate those different categories. Okay. So that one, we actually disc uh, develop a new embedding method called category name guided embedding. The general philosophy is this. Okay. When you calculate embedding, you can put a category name as a condition to calculate this probability. You see our probability essentially is composed of three different components. One, the rightmost one essentially is word of that. If you think about it, you look at W word, the I's position, you look at the plus minus J's position, okay? Look at that. However, you need, you need the documents, the short documents, you look at the word, the probability in the short documents. This one is, we just say, a little global one. This is local, this is global. However, we want this probability to be guided by the category names. This category C in this document, we're payroll. Okay. If we calculate in this way, we can kick in something like, uh, EM, this kind of clustering algorithm, you can redo the computation, you may capture nice semantics. Okay. We actually did this study, published paper in 2020 uh, Triple W conference. You, you first may see the we, we studied the topic coherence versus and the mean accuracy, these two measures. Okay. We take the very large documents like New York Times. Uh, the guided could be by location or by topic. We take a year of reviews. It could be guided by food, those items, or guided by sentiment. Okay. So you probably can see with different guidance, we can actually do far better topic clustering than RDA, those topic modeling approach, or even seeded RDA. You probably can see it's far better. I can give you the concrete results. You probably will be convinced. Okay, we take the large uh, corpus from New York Times from year to review. Okay, we give one category as location. So we say we want to ca categorize. You know, we want to find topics. One is Britain, the other is Canada. Okay, 
Then you look at our hate algorithm. You probably can see uh, under Britain, you find England, London, Britain, Scottish, Great Britain. Under Canada, you find Ontario, Toronto, Quebec, Montreal, Ottawa. You probably can see this is almost like human. You can find this. However, if you use RDA or seeded RDA, you probably can find only you can find you know, very small number of things like uh, British, uh, but it, you find in York, it could either be in Canada or in Britain because they both have the city of York, okay? So you will find even for, for food, you probably can see uh, you, you, you get burger versus desserts. You probably can see the Kate can find the different kinds of burgers, different kinds of desserts, okay? Even for good versus bad, you can see the good versus bad. Or alternative words, you can find it very clear. That's the power of discriminative topic mining, or you say category guided embedding. Okay. And with this category guided embedding, we actually go down into the into the hierarchical space. For example, those blue ones are the human given ones. That means you give us. Uh, a level, for example, give us something like uh, sports versus arts versus science, but also go down. Under sports, you get baseball, soccer, tennis. Okay. With this, we go into, still go into New York Times. You probably can see, like uh, under arts, we get uh, music, dance, movies, design, and theater. And these white ones, uh, all things we generate by ourselves, okay, by, by the, we call the joint spherical tree and taxing bed. If you can see those words are pretty sensitive uh, for, the, for the different titles in a hierarchical way. We even tried with, uh, with COVID-19 analysis. Uh, that time the COVID-19 just came out, okay. Uh, we study PubMed, and we give the tree, the tree essentially is PubMed, uh, those kind of uh, trees. You probably can see uh, under biological active substance, you have hormone, you have enzyme, you have vitamin, you have vaccines, okay? Uh, then we go down to PubMed article to see under like vaccines or vitamins or enzyme, what we were finding. You probably can see we find lots of words really associated with different vitamins, different vaccines, different enzymes. Okay, so that shows actually it's pretty effective. Even this software knows nothing about a biological scientist. So with this, we found we probably can use these tools to dig in the taxonomy and use taxonomy to do text mining. Okay. So the first try we try to dig out taxonomy is we try to see whether we can do set expansion. This one we did the first work in 2019, work out an article called set expand. What is set expand? Set expand is you give me a set, let's say Georgia, Illinois, Virginia, a set of, uh, say a, a, you can think a C set of states in the US. Okay. The problem is if we get a large article, for example, Wikipedia or New York Times, can we dig out a different kind of US states, but also not including say Canadian province or Mexico provinces? So the trick, what we did was this, we look at the skip grounds, the context feature, okay? The context feature, you probably can see there are some context feature we can automatically dig out from the large corpus. But the problem is these context feature, sometimes it works, sometimes it's too noisy. Without human intervene, you know, how can we figure out those noises? Okay. So the problem we got is, what we did is we take those contexts, we partition them into multiple, you know, context feature set. Okay. With this multiple context feature set, we actually can derive lots of candidates based on similar contexts, other names like California, Arizona, 
they may have these contacts. The problem is such contacts sometimes may introduce noises. Without a human tra training, you only give me three seeds, Georgia, Illinois, and Virginia. How can we, without ambiguity, without uh, to derive the high quality ones? Okay. So what do we develop a method called, you know, rank ensemble? What is rank ensemble? Is we partition them into different sets. Okay. For each set, we derive a few ranked expansions. Okay. But we do not trust any one of them fully, but we trust their ensemble. That means if you see, you know, like suppose Quebec is, is a noisy one because it's not a state in the US. However, this one derived this, but how about the other ones? If the other ones do not support such derivation, but they may support say California, Arizona as US states, then likely Arizona and California will be ranked higher. So we use this rank ensemble to get a collective votes. We can automatically retain the high quality ones and these high quality ones will be feed back as a new seed. So we can keep doing this in the iterative way. And with computer we can do it really fast. We can derive you know, high quality ones. Okay. The problem is if you, we take a Illinois, Georgia, Virginia as the initial seeds. The first several we derived actually are very high quality. But with, with gradual expansion, you introduce noise. For example, if you derive something like Chicago, but once you derive Chicago, Chicago will drag, say, Atlanta, Richmond also in, then you will get a lot of messy ones. Okay. The problem is can we automatically? You know, without human intervene, just based on statistics, you can exclude something. Okay. So in 2020, we developed one called set co expand. What is set co expand? That's okay. We know with the gradual expansion, it's unavoidable. You grab the nearby things, like you grab cities or you grab country names down into your state. Can we automatically somehow guard against it? Okay. Of course, initially in our setting span, is we try to rank them low, try to kick them off. But you know, because there are lots of similarities, you rank them low, they will come back. Okay. Can we do something better? Okay. What we did better is instead of kicking them out, we put them into a con contrasting sets. That means we let them grow, okay? But we know they are negative sets. When they grow, they grab their similar things there, they automatically form negative barriers, okay? So with this results, for example, you grab US states, you try to expand, and accidentally you put a Chicago or United States inside the set. So you know they are somehow you know, not pure, they are noise. Instead of get rid of noise, okay, we actually set them as a contrasting set, they themselves expanding as well. With this way, this set co-expansion will have two or three con contrasting set. Keep expanding, squeeze your boundary so you will derive better things, okay. Another way we publish in the ACL is Instead of just thinking about, you know, like a seed set, we also use the language features, for example, uh, Hersey patterns or those language features. We actually using, you know, a language model, pre-trained language model like BERT, okay? So we, find, we can grab, for example, here, we set up a mask using BERT. We actually can grab this one likely you have states, US states, large states as potential candidate names. Okay. With those potential candidate names, you actually will use those things in other language to grab them as well. So that means your set expansion, take advantage of mass, you know, pre-trained language model, you actually can do better. Okay. So for example, you just see this, 
we give a few seats like uh, Patriotic Act, Obamacare, uh, uh, Clary Act. We actually can grab lots and lots of the expanded seats with ESPN, CBS, we grab all the different news you know, channels, TV channels. With like a World War, Cold War, uh, we actually grab lots of other wars, okay? So you probably can see this is pretty sensitive. And you look at a, you know, quantitative evaluation to probably see our set expand, co set co expand, CG expand, finally can get a pretty good accuracy comparing to other methods. Okay. With this, we get into the hierarchies. The hierarchy means we're not just thinking of one level of static span. You give a few seats in a hierarchical way. For example, you can give US, Canada as a country. You can give California, Illinois, Texas, uh, you know, Arizona as a state in, under US. That's all you give. Then you plow through say New York Times or Wikipedia or the others, you can see we can expand in two ways. One way is we expand on everyone's wits. That means from US can China, we can grab, we can get a Canada, Mexico, Russia, Germany. In. And from California, you know, you can get other states in. But in the meantime, for each one, like Canada and Mexico, we can get their sibling and expansion as well. So you can do hierarchical expansion, okay? How can we do hierarchical expansion? Actually, this hierarchical expansion is very much similar to the word that. You can think of it this way, okay? If you calculate, we just mentioned about a parallelogram, okay? If you look at this, if you say with the United States, uh, California, we know their parent-child relationship. When you get China, you probably can get, uh, say, Guangdong, you know, like uh, under the, you know, uh, with a similar parallelogram, you can grab the provinces under China. Okay. With this, you probably can expand in both ways, in the width expansion and depth expansion and width expansion as well. So you can uh, generate a pretty good you know, like, uh, you know, uh, hierarchies, okay? This is what we did. This is the seed, for example, under seed, like under natural language processing, we derive lots of words or phrases related to natural language processing, related to image processing, you can see that, okay? And with this, we actually, uh, with a, with a expansion, you know, especially the, the, pre-trained language models, we actually can see, you can expand in many different ways to control the hierarchy generation. For example, when you expand this, you can expand both down part and up part. The down part means you get, a, you get dessert. You can, of course you can get a cake and pudding, you can go down, but you also can go up. Under dessert, you can generate to say, instead of say this one is a root, you actually can generate something higher level like a lunch or food or dish. And this, you know, both up and down can confine your, your expansion quality. You actually can get a very high quality. We call these ones, you know, using co-expansion and relation extraction, you can get this. With this, it attracts you know, attention by Microsoft Research, a group of people who work on uh, academic graph. Okay, they call it a, uh, some kind of mag, it's massive academic graph, okay? uh, both in computer science and other sciences. Okay. Uh, we work with uh, Microsoft Research, okay? Uh, they, in their, you know, academic graph uh, group, what they have is they already have pretty large existing taxonomy. The problem is since the, the science keep moving ahead, it generates lots of new terms. Where this term should go, okay? So that means once you have a pretty large, you know, taxonomy, can we expand it automatically with the new words coming? Okay, 
Uh, the, the thing, of course, you can use human labeling, but human labeling is very expensive, we know that. And can we use the existing taxonomy as our supervision? Okay. Actually, we can because existing taxonomy itself give you sharp parent relationship nicely. For example, under machine learning, you get supervised, uh, unsupervised, or semi-supervised. <clears throat> Those becomes you know, parent-child relationships you get lots of such relationship, okay? With such relationship, you give us a new one, okay? For example, suppose uh, in a tree, <clears throat> you get a new core, you get a, say, high dependency unit. Where is your go? Okay. So the, the interesting thing is we need to find, if we can find somewhere, we can find the core, and because with the existing hierarchy, it, it, you want to find the core. You actually will find the similarity. Hospital room, under hospital room, you already have intensive care unit. You have a low dependency unit. And uh, above hospital room, you have a room, you have a hospital. Okay. This whole thing, you based on embedding, you based on the core concept, like high dependency unit, you character embedding you will find somewhere closer to this part, okay? And with this, you will try to find the anchor concept and their children, likely could be your future siblings, and their grandparents or, or parents. And with this, you will be able to locate where this new concept should be put in, okay? So this, with this way, with embedding with existing supervision, with existing taxonomy, you will be able to do a lot of good things, okay? What we did is we take a query concept, an anchor concept as a candidate. You try to match to see how closely they match based on embedding, okay? The, based on such supervision embedding, you will be able to locate where it should go, okay? And we actually tried with this method, of course, the detail ones in the paper, but you can see is uh, we actually can, can get the true ones very high. Of course, sometimes you do have a few, uh, you know, just because likely with such a large, like a tens of thousands concept in the hierarchy, sometimes you may not give a very, very right precision, uh, prediction. For example, we get a new one, say email hacking, okay? Uh, if you look at the prediction uh, we got, we get like a hacker, we get a internet privacy, but actually the true parent is computer security. Uh, you probably can see there, of course you get something wrong, but it's, it's a reasonable, okay? You, you can see we checked it, we got a pretty high accuracy, but uh, Comparing to the existing taxonomy, you have 24,000 existing nodes. Sometimes you may misplace it, okay? But if it's not too bad, okay, you with human intervene, you know, checking, you actually can save lots of work uh, for human, okay? So we actually calculate their accuracy as well, okay? And with this, we actually got into whether if we get a, a document, whether we can put in the taxonomy in the right place, okay? That one means the document text classification. You probably know majority of text classification is you give lots of labels, lots of training set, then you use a conditional random field or some kind of typical method. Uh, of course, even with neural networks uh, coming in, people are using lots of training set, uh, ask the bird or some creature in large language model to do it. Okay. The problem is the training is very expensive. Can we use very minimal training? We call weekly supplies. How weak it should be? For example, okay, one scenario is you only give the category name, say politics, sports, technology. Or you can give a set of keywords like this. Or you can give a set, a small set of labor documents. Weekly means you give really, really small. Okay, how small it is? If you say use labor only, that means you only give the labor names. 
or use a class read keywords, each one only gives three to three, four, like those kind of keywords, or three to five, uh, you know, uh, labor documents. We first developed a method in 2018 and 2019 is we take uh, these weekly supervised method. We work out a text generation, try to generate something. If you know there's a politics and sports technology, you try to generate words, very similar to that. Then you generate the pseudo documents, you put them into deep uh, neural network methods, you train them, you get the right model, you get pretty high uh, classification accuracy. However, we found that this is still not enough. Okay. I'll probably give you one typical example you probably see why it is not enough. Okay. For example, you want to you know, distinguish, say, sports versus uh, business versus uh, politics versus something, history or something. But if you look at these two examples, two sentences, Okay, they both have the word sports, but the, the first one, the sports, is really our common sports because you look at surrounding words, you get a baseball, football, basketball, hockey. Okay, but if you look at the second one, say Samsung's new mobile phone sports built in hard disk and uh, you know 15 times more data or something. But if you look at the sports, you've probably found. This one has nothing to do with the typical sports, okay. but how can machine automatically identify this? Okay. The interesting thing is with the recently pre-trained language model like BERT, it can, you mask the sports. They will tell you some truth, okay? You mask the sports, you run BERT, they will give you the candidates like sports, baseball, handball, okay? But if mask the sports here in this, Context. They will give you has or features or includes. That means this sports actually is a, is a fancy word to say has those features. Okay, so they are different. Using pre-trained language model can do a lot of good. So what we did is we take the embedding, we take pre-trained language model, then we plow through. We use the labor data only. That means. If you want to classify the text politics versus sports versus business versus technology, you only give these labor names. Okay. Then with massive data, we are going to automatically generate lots and lots of very good candidates. With such candidates, you can do high quality text classification. Okay. So you probably can see what our performance uh, our very weak supervision means we only use those category names. Okay. Uh, previous study, there are studies, for example, data list classification or our own one, like we, you know, weekly supervised text classification or BERT with some simple match. And this lock class means our mess, new method for labor only text classification. You probably can see this labor only can get a really, really good result. Okay. But if you compare with uh, lots of training data, for example, semi-supervised or fully supervised, what is fully supervised? That means you really have a tens of thousand keywords. Okay. Then you, you take this as a supervision, you get tens of uh, uh, thousands of those uh, labor documents, they still can get better. However, you probably can see, we did a little study on this. Is we use a labor name only. Okay. And this one label, actually comparing with fully supervised bird, we feed them, you know, like a, a, how many labels we can give. We actually found, okay, for per class, okay, for the bird, the fully supervised version, they have to feed in like a 48 labels for each class. That means you have 10 classes, you have to feed in 480 labels, you can achieve the same performance as our last class. Okay. Of course, you feed more data, you get, get an even better performance. But in reality, in many cases, you may not have that many labels. You can see this labor only classification. 
of the old category name only classification, IP3 PAL. Okay. And with this, another very important thing is with taxonomy, whether we can do better classification. Okay. We already show you the text classification we can we we did it with some kind of a taxonomy can do a lot of really good. But the real problem, actually, this one is another one from uh, Microsoft Research. They actually give us a, a real uh, one of this. Okay. For if you think about scientific research papers, you have actually, if you look at the academic graph, you will have this 25,000 candidate class. Even you look at the Amazon like product review, you may find you have 15,000 candidate classes. The question becomes, you give me a review article. Can I put this one into the right class? Okay. But in many cases, the class is not one. For example, you get diaper review. Some could be based on like the class labor could be temper. Some could be baby products, some could be diapers or something. You, you can see you may need multiple labels. Okay. That means what we really want is for each document, we want to tag a set of relevant labels from a huge candidate pool. Huge means you have tens of thousands. Okay. Can we do this without human intervention? Okay. Because Human interviewing, of course, you can do it, but the human is very expensive. It's better you think about it. You got 100,000 classes. Okay. So, how can we do this? We use taxonomy again. Okay. With taxonomy, if we give a document, we take the existing taxonomy, can we put the documents into the right label and also grab the surrounding one? For example, suppose. You, you get a core class, you say this one is rank SBM, okay? And you say it should belong to rank SBM for this document, but also you per se, it likely should be also labor learning to rank, information retrieval, relevance feedback, or implicit feedback. You probably can see, if you can get one or two core classes labor, Likely their parents or common grandparents could be good candidates as well. Okay. If we can do that, we can label, you know, give multiple class labels for a document, even your class space is tens of thousands. Okay. Can we do this? Okay. We develop a method. The method just published in this year's NACO, uh, North America ACL. Okay. Uh, this method called taxoclass, which means based on taxonomy, we try to multi-class classification. How can we do it? What we are doing is we take advantage of this taxonomy. Instead of thinking about you randomly pick this one and say there are 25,000 labels, I try to find which one that, you know, is a closer map. Actually, what we do is we go from the top down. How can we go top down? That means you are thinking at the very beginning, at the top level under computer science, you probably see instead of there are hundreds, thousands of labels, you probably only have 10 labels. Okay. For this 10 labels, you likely can say, oh, this one may be either information retriever or data. You probably can identify one or two good labels. You say, I'm pretty sure under this one. Then you look at their children, then look at their children's children. Every time you do classification this way, okay, then you may be able to find a good core classes. Okay. So what you can see is this, okay. We take this document, we start from top down. Okay. Top down means at the very beginning, you don't really have many candidates at the top level. We try to identify one or two really high level, of course, based on measure. For example, if you say this information retrieval is 0 0.7 confidence, the other one is very scattered, you can just say likely it was just the information retrieval. Then you can go down, you may find there, you know, say 
there is a 0 0.75 is learning to rank, but they are 0 0.3 is not too bad. You can re retain two candidates, you can go down. Then once you can find something matched really high, for example, this document you match really high is SVM rank. Okay, then you will say this SVM rank likely will be the four class. You probably can see you can find four class. Once you can find four class, you look at their parents or so, likely they could be the candidate. Another one is to look at it collection-wise. You get a four class, you look at a collective document, look at their similarity, you probably can find the, the most relevant documents as well, okay? With this, you probably can see, we take, just give you an example, one is DBRP, one is Amazon. For DBRP, you can see this is document. The document uh, said, oh, there's something like a behavior testing, testing NRP models or something here. Then if you go down, you say, you, you can see, we can, by going down, we actually can find a one likely core class is NLP evaluation. Another one actually under software engineering, because you have the behavior testing, under software engineering, you can identify behavior in testing as another potential you know, core class. So if we can identify these core classes, we can go up, to see what's the similarity, then we can identify their parents, likely it could be the right one as well, then you probably can see we can identify this. This Amazon, you probably can see, the review is pretty shaky. They actually said, uh, when our son was about four months old, doctor said we, we could give him PrEP to zero or something like this. This is about product. With this, you probably see, we first, find this one likely will be a baby product or you can go down. You finally may find a crafted zero and baby zero are very, very relevant. You identify these two core classes. Then following this, you try to identify their parents, which one likely will be better potential candidates. If they have some common grandparents or something, you can grab them as well. Or some directly based on the evaluation of the quality, you can grab their grandparents. So with this, we can get a few related labels with the indication of the core class, okay? So I ignore some detail, but you can see comparing to many related methods, we actually this Texel class give you a really high quality uh, if you look at a physician at a one, that means the top one, whether you grab them. Or you look at an F1, you can see we get a pretty high F1 value as well. Okay. So that's the reason the work we did. Okay. You probably can see there are lots of related work. The related work mainly is how can we develop, a, say, different kind of embedding, language model, and all those new methods to dig in the text mining part and try to dig out knowledge out of it. Okay. I can give you one interesting study we, we showed. Uh, we actually did uh, some on the Ukraine-Russia conflicts with a very large corporate. This one is uh, in 2019, the Hong Kong protests. We did this tax analysis. Uh, what we did was we only give very small number of seats. It's like a tech, you know, category guided, but some category is a little too vague. For example, you probably can see the category on economic or information. Information is two big words. Infrastructure is two big words. We actually give three seats for each one. For example, infrastructure, we give Hong Kong University Transportation International Airport. So with this, we plow through this Hong Kong protest corpus. We actually, you, you can see, you find something pretty interesting. For example, under police, you actually find lots of the police using water cannon, pepper spray, petrol bomb, or beam bombs, or tear gas, you know, to, to deal with the protesters. So if you can see this, and for information, you can find all the different media, including like internet censorship, all these things. That means you actually can grab lots and lots of related key phrases automatically 
without thinking about human give you lots of supervision. Then you can do classification, you can do lots of things quite meaningfully. Okay. So you probably see our roadmap essentially is we promote with massive text corpus, big data uh, majority actually contain natural language text. Instead of thinking about lots of supervision annotation, we essentially just rely on, heavily rely on large knowledge base like a Wikipedia. Then we kick in like phrase mining, uh, entity relationship extraction. Then we construct taxonomy, doing classification in a multi-dimensional way. Then we move towards automated knowledge mining by mining structures we got from the massive text. So with those uh, this, uh, studies, you pretty can see, I started with data mining the textbook and we gradually moved on to link mining, to mining heterogeneous information networks, mining latent entity structures. That's, that was done before 2015, okay? However, in recent years, you pretty can see, we did a lot, get a lot of things into uh, mining, like uh, these uh, phrase mining, you know, mining structures from the text, then mining multi-dimensional, you know, text uh, cubes from the text data. So uh, these studies generate lots of dissertation work uh, under KDD because they found that actually it's a, it's a really good uh, study, can guide a lot of data miners to deal with massive text, okay? So we generate lots of research papers. Uh, my talk is essentially based on the research papers I list here. Uh, you probably saw the first uh, authors, a group of first authors here. The majority authors uh, from like Yimang, Jia Jinghua, Jiaming, Shen. Yimang actually received 2021, this year's Google PhD fellowship. For structured data and database, that's the only Google Peach Fellowship given to North American. So he got it. And uh, Jia Xing Huang received uh, Microsoft Research 2021 PhD Fellowship. And uh, they also only give one in the, in the, in the structured data field. And uh, Jia Xing got it. Uh, Jia Ming actually graduating this year and the Google Research graduated him right away. So that shows, you know, the, the work actually is very interesting, exciting from even from Google research and Microsoft research point of view. Okay. So we did get lots of uh, support from like a DARPA, natural language, Pro, uh, NSF, NIH, uh, Army Research Lab, and a lot of industry. So we just put uh, our acknowledgement here. So I'm open for question answering. I think I still have five more minutes. We can have some discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Han. Uh, questions, anyone? Yeah, let's thank Dr. Han. The Zoom way. <laughs> yeah. um, I had so, a question. Go ahead, Connor. Um, so thank you. This is very um, this is very interesting. Um, so you showed how you know you can get these um, very expressive embeddings. What is the sort of like lowest unit that you can you, lowest unit of language that you can work with? You have um, do you use like byte pair encodings like some of the bigger language models do, or do does each word have its own you know representation in your workflow? Yeah, actually, uh, for the language model, you probably know the recent years generate lots and lots of uh, you know language model with really large models. Uh, the study here, majority are using like a BERT. Okay, we use a language model, uh, but we recent years we also start using even more like Electra, like uh, Roberta, you know, all these different models. But the, the general philosophy here is uh, not saying use more and more, uh, more powerful language model, of course, we'll do better. The interesting key thing here, you probably can see the first one is you 
you have to think about the, the embedding. Actually, just explore the embedding. You may want to embed it in a different way. For example, one way you think about it is why you just look at the very close ones. You just look at this one. This one said we look at a plus minus k. Okay. Plus minus k, you cannot make it too big k. That's why you start from word to back, people were thinking about the whole language, like bidirectional whole sentence, like a verb. Okay. However, even you look at this, you perceive sometimes you need even bigger context in multiple sentences instead of just one. Okay. And this one, of course, you can say I can introduce like a probability in the topic modeling approach. However, topic modeling ignore the positions like front or after, you just think everything is back or worse. That's going go back and forth. And here, what you are thinking about is you need the probability computation under the documents. That's a little like a topic modeling. But you also need your surrounding words, the order, the, the context words, right? It, this is more like our pre-trained language model. You need integration of both. That's the, the message we learned from this Jose practice. That means you need to rethink the whole game. Okay? Then you integrate those strings. Another thing is when we do the embedding, if you look at our embedding here, you, you can see this Kate embedding, is why you just think about embedding without thinking people's need, okay? That means the embedding you calculate, the pre-computed, including Burke, including all the others, you compute the whole embedding without thinking how people will use it. Okay? However, people do have different way to think about it. If you think your category name is politics versus science versus literature, your embedding will be different for people thinking about different countries, okay? So if you think in that way, you carve your embedding from the very high dimensional to the relatively low dimensional under your guidance, you probably can make this embedding even better, okay? So that's the lesson we learned from this study. All right, thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? So I'll ask one. So there yeah. has been work on uh, knowledge graphs and then embedding knowledge graphs and using knowledge graphs with BERT. And I mean, Google also uses uh, serious knowledge graphs and so on. So how does this work uh, sort of uh, is related to that and are there differences in philosophy that uh, th those works versus yours are. Uh, yeah, taking. yeah, this is a great question. Actually, uh, I think the knowledge graphs or uh, networks, there are lots of recent studies on network embedding, including knowledge graph embedding, including network embedding. Uh, we also did some study, I just did not have time to, to you know, lecture on that, that line of work. But the interesting thing we observed, especially we got a 2021 wisdom paper, I do not have the uh, time to lecture it. Uh, what we found is this, okay. For example, that study was uh, studying about citation network, okay. Then you want to use citation network to do better classification, okay. So citation, the, the network of people, uh, one paper cite the others, definitely it contains lots of information. However, this kind of a link, if you use it, you want to use it for site, for classification. We have to know human build the citations was not for the purpose of classification. They, they cite this paper, not because this paper is 100% belong to the same class as your paper. You cite O1 because you want to reference it, you need it. You know, some for different purposes. For example, you say, I use this method to do my classification, but that method itself may not be on classification, right? So that means the, the network they build this is for different purposes. No matter it's knowledge graph or, or citation network or other network, they have different purposes. So your link 
on the network may or may not be good for your classification. It does give you lots of hints. However, it does contain noise or incompleteness. That means those papers are in the same category as yours. You may not cite everyone. You only cite a small portion. Okay. On the other hand, you may also cite the other portions, like uh, something maybe is foundational, algorithm or something, you cite this part. Okay, how can we distinguish this? The interesting thing is we look at the network, we, we use our text embedding, use all these methods, we analyze it. We found if you take this existing network, do some kind of enhancement, refinement. That means if you want to do document classification, you look at this citation network, you see this citation network may or may not serve a 100% good purpose for your classification, what do you do? You actually take the embedding, you take the, the links, you do some kind of a compensation refinement. That means if you are pretty sure this citation is not for your classification, you can remove it or de-emphasize it, put it less weight. If something you, know, you think likely will help you, you can enhance it. With this adjustment of your network, re, we call refinement of your network, then you use, say, graph neural network model or something. You can derive better or sometimes far better results. So that's why we think the text information putting in to your even existing knowledge graph or network, you use this to refine your graph or network. You can get even better results. That's based on our 2021 wisdom paper. We actually learned the lesson. We think actually the text mining, this embedding can help network mining or network embedding as well. So that's why we learned. Uh, uh, I just did not really got time to, to lecture to discuss that yeah. piece of work. Yeah. That's, yeah, so, I have seen some of these works, but I haven't seen the wisdom paper. I'll look forward to reading it. Thank you very much. Uh, um, yes. Any other questions? All right, so let's thank uh, Dr. Han once again, and um, we will, uh, some of us um, have, you know, other questions or something, please feel to email me or Dr. Han directly, and uh, thank you everyone for coming, uh, and thanks again, uh, Dr. Han. It was a great talk, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone else did. Thanks. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Okay, thanks, thanks for your invitation. Okay. okay, good. So we'll see you each other uh, yeah. after this pandemic. We probably will meet in the conferences, right? Right. Okay. Most Thank possibly you. in a conference okay. or yeah. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.